Hello, and welcome to another Sports Next Door podcast. My name is Owen. Today is Monday, April 5th. Happy Easter Monday. And I'm joined, as I always am, by my neighbor, Max. How's it going, my friend? Pretty well. I'm, I've talked a couple times about Attack on Titan, at which ends next Friday, or this coming Friday, the 9th, when we'll be recording our next podcast. So I'm going through the manga for one last reread right now, and I'm a little in shambles about how in shambles I'm going to be in the not-too-distant future. But other than that, I had a pretty solid Easter weekend. How about you? Yeah, not too bad. Didn't really do anything too exciting. Uh, had a, a Easter dinner, college style, uh, on the weekend. We got some cheese. We got some alcohol and just put some stuff together. I don't know if you've ever had raclette before. No, what is that? So it's like, I, I always call it kind of like reverse fondue, but essentially it's this grill and you put, you have all these like mini trays. You put slices of cheese on the trays. And then the trays sit in the heat and melt, and then you put the melted cheese on stuff. So it's a little bit more sanitary than fondue. Okay. <laughs> I, I do remember uh, we were on a family trip in Italy once, and I think some nights at restaurants out for dinner, my sister maybe not too into the real Italian cuisine. Mm-hmm. So one night she heard they had grilled cheese, and she ordered it. A grilled cheese and she might have gotten that because they uh, came out with pieces of cheese that were grilled <laughs> we we're like okay not uh quite what we had in mind that's awesome yeah so i was able to do some of that uh play a little 2k and then yesterday was gorgeous so i spent most yes. of the day outside i got to have the baseball game on which was nice and relaxing yeah it was a pretty good sports weekend all in all for sure you're nodding you were yawning a bit before we got into the show maybe like a cumulative weekend sugar crash yeah that's definitely on the table had a lot of jelly beans a lot of easter chocolate um i i got this 11 inch bunny sent to me in the mail from my family which was very nice but yes also i just i consistently yawn if i'm not actively doing an activity so (laughs) i don't know what that is about but here we are. And I guess I will make the rough and grinding transition over to sports, but your smoothest segue, but go ahead. <laughs> I'll break down the agenda for today on the podcast. Uh, we will start with some hockey. Uh, then we have the combat corner, a little bit of basketball, a little bit of tennis, and then finish up with a little bit of baseball, a uh, bunch of everything, some awesome action over the weekend, but we will start with the Toronto Maple Leafs, who are now 6-0-1 in their last seven games. Uh, That slump feels like years ago, and they're right back where they need to be, firmly in first position in the North Division. Max, uh, two games that we caught since the last podcast. What are your big thoughts about the, the Leafs, who are back on fire, my friend? Yeah, statistically, looking just at games one, back on fire, Maybe not the most satisfying wins you're going to see over our last two, but four points, four points, and there's definitely a lot of positives you can take away from these last two. I I thought the Leafs-Jets game, probably a preview of what to come as we get closer down the stretch, and especially for the playoffs, a very tight game low action for most of it hard to get a ton of offense going but they stuck in there defensively and Campbell had another great game and almost a monkey off the back or reassuring to see we can get some points and shoot out which may come in handy down the stretch though disappointed to see the three on three streak end and then this Leafs Flames game I I didn't catch all of it. I actually just caught the last 10 minutes of the third period once the Leafs were up 4-2. So I hear it was a bit of a snoozer in the first two. Definitely not the Leafs' best hockey and more maybe to dump on the Flames than praise the Leafs in this one. But I'll get into that when we wrap up our uh, Leafs talk. How do you feel about how the weekend went? Uh, I will never, ever complain about a win. <laughs> and even if there are some things that I'd like to see change, uh, I'm always going to lead it off with with happy thoughts, right? You can never, ever complain about a win. And I agree. Uh, so I watched most of the first two periods. So together, we kind of caught that whole Toronto-Calgary game. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, but what I what I'm seeing is it's people might be complaining about the lack of like action, but that's kind of what you want out of this Leafs team is you want them to learn how to play different styles because over the last couple of years, they have been the team that has just been chaos and all over the place. And it's going to be a ton of goals both ways. And if this is a team that can actually play with more defensive responsibility, as we've seen this season, uh, they slow down the pace, they reduce high danger chances, uh, then they will end up having the top end talent that should win out in tighter games. And that's at least what you would hope. So I, I don't mind the snooze fests if if it's the Leafs are playing sound defensive hockey. Um, on the other side, the Flames they had they had like uh, some semblance of momentum when Mangiapane scored right before the end of that first period, and then they just came out so flat. And I I don't know. I just there's there's so much that's happened to this team and the coaching changes and the response to to Sutter and I don't know if he's going to be the answer, but they just. Their guys are on the move at the end of the season, for sure. Something has to be changed uh, because they came out and uh, Tavares had a, a squeaker of a goal and, and that completely changed all the momentum and uh, the Leafs kind of dominated the first 15 minutes of that third period, in my opinion. But uh, yeah, I, yeah, again, not much to say. The, well, the Flames what- Watching that third period, I kind of flashed back to earlier, a week and a half, two weeks ago, when I was watching the Flames and Senators through a triple header. And it was, they had a very similar game where they were up one nothing going into the third against the Sens. And then the Sens came back, tied it up, took the lead. And you just saw no urgency from the Flames in the third period. And at times in this third period against the Leafs, I, it looked like the Leafs were in practice, honestly. They were taking the puck up through the neutral zone and with such a casual breakout pace, not maybe the most dangerous scoring chances generated on that breakout, but a lot of clean passes, easy entries, not having to hustle too hard on the forecheck, but still getting back with plenty of time to spare defensively. And then, like you said, the first 15 minutes of that third period, probably all Leafs, the last three minutes, they get their goalie pulled, but it's just a perimeter show. The The puck never really made it into the slot in that six on five, despite a lot of possession in the Calgary time. And if we want to praise the Leafs, we can say they did a pretty effective job there. I liked there were no real breakdowns in their five man coverage against that uh, extra man attack, but the Flames just, they have to find a way to generate some scoring chances in those late game opportunities so I was thinking like man they had this breakdown uh, against the Leafs tonight where they got outscored in the third period I was flashing back to that Ottawa series so I dug a little further and in their last 10 games which I guess is Daryl Sutter's first 10 games with the team they've been outscored 13 to 7 in the third period They've outscored teams in the third period just twice in those 10 games, and they have a 2-8 and eight record. And four of those 10 games, they've directly lost in the third period. And that was what I saw when I said after that Ottawa game, the Calgary Flames playoff hopes are zero. And I, I saw just no way in for them. And I realized they still have five games left against the Habs. So statistically, there's a chance you get 10 points and you hold the Habs off for 10 points. But this team that loses almost every third period they play, even if they can pick up one or two, you feel like with the lack of urgency they have down the stretch, the Habs are just going to beat them like four times out of five, I'd say. Let's see if that holds up. Yeah, definitely excited to watch the end of that. Uh, Another thing that I was really happy about in this game was uh, Gouch getting his first goal as a member of the Leafs. Uh, He hit a post in their game against the Jets on Friday night and has been all around the net. He finally gets one on a rather gorgeous play. Nylander, a low shot. Tavares receives it and just touches it across the crease. uh, And Gouch gets a pretty easy one, but he he still, you got to put it away. And and he did so. And uh, yeah, just happy for him to get one to validate all the effort he's been putting in so far on that second line. Uh, really enjoyed the effort and and Michael Hutchinson 
after we said that he may never start for the Leafs again in that dreadful pulling, uh, I think it was against Ottawa. Mm-hmm. And, and he now in his last two starts has been really solid. And he still is a guy who, who's a bit scrambly in the net. And you're never going to be 100% comfortable with him back there. But again, he puts the team in a place to win in, in two starts in a row and uh, is making his way back into the good graces of, of Leafs fans. Because obviously, I guess the Leafs are not too confident in Beveline and yet to throw him in. So it's still Hutch and Campbell for now uh, getting the rotation. And if Hutch can continue to play like this, then we can continue to pick up wins. I still think they need to address the goaltending situation. I don't want to have Hutch in a playoff game. <laughs> yeah, I am I mean, you hope every game Hutch starts is a game or a day, two days, that much closer to Freddie Anderson being able to get healthy and get back in there. And as long as they're playing well, there's no rush, which you have to think he was starting and playing just for lack of any other option. And then as soon as Campbell's health picked up to the point where he could start consistently as it has Anderson hasn't even been on the bench since so you've got to think Freddie was playing through some stuff based on how long we're seeing him out for and how pulled they are so maybe we have to take that into consideration when we assess his last few performances before his absence and you hope that he's just going to be 100% when he gets back in there. I still have those same reservations you're saying about Hutch, but you've got to praise it when you see it and praiseworthy performance tonight for sure. Another reason why I don't mind the snooze fest is because if we're running our backup goalie out there, you just want to limit the amount of chances he's getting against him and, and reduce that variability. So well done by the Leafs and, and they get their first shootout win of the season on Friday Jason Spezza with a very nice one after he tamed the bouncing puck it will go back in forehand Campbell shuts the door uh not much to say about that one I guess the last thing I want to get to about the Leafs would be the power play and I already touched about it a ton on Friday but it continues to struggle and they had a four on three in overtime against the Jets uh and and didn't generate a ton in, in this game last night, but just they continue to have struggles and I don't know what the fix is. Uh, but I was wondering, Max, if you had any more thoughts on the power play that we hadn't covered. No, I I have in the notes. I, I don't remember if it was on the four on three or earlier in the game. I remember Nylander having a one timer that the power play set up beautifully. And it was another moment where you hold your breath. You hope uh, Nylander got it on net, but not at his uh, top shelf best where if he had been that goes in and that just goes to the importance of momentum and the difficulties when your power plays in a slump i think the leafs at their best that goal goes in eight nine times out of ten and right now it feels like two three times out of ten so you've just got to keep at it and eventually one of those is going to go in and then hopefully that generates some momentum and gets going there's still plenty of the season to work it out so as long as they stay on top of the division and as long as it's solved come playoff time bear with it and suffer through the struggles right now definitely all right we will switch gears and move on to another couple of teams in the canadian division Uh, i guess we'll talk briefly about the ottawa senators beating uh, the montreal canadians on saturday to break up their little mini run that they were on a 6-3 game uh yes barry coquette niemi was not happy Uh, there's a clip of him getting off one of his shifts and just breaking his stick into like four separate pieces on the bench, his teammate there sitting, you just see the second smash and the teammate goes, <laughs> just, and sorry for the podcast listeners. I just slid my chair into the desk, but he jumps away with fright. Um, yeah. The, the Habs know there's a lot of pressure on them from the fan base, from the coaching staff, from ownership that this is an, a great opportunity for them to do something. And so they have the pressure on them every game because they sit in that final playoff spot and so every game means something down the final stretch of the season and uh, you, as you can see I guess the players are really feeling it yeah I, I really do feel like the four teams are locked at this point it would take both a spectacular collapse and spectacular upwards effort from the Canucks or the Flames which I just don't see happening for anything to shift in the playoffs. It's kind of just a question of who's going to be matched up against who. And even then there's no easy answers. Like you might have 
teams feeling like they'd rather be against the Oilers or excuse me, the Jets, the Leafs or the Oilers, depending if you're the Habs. So I think it's more about getting your game to the highest level it can be than who you're going to be matched up in the playoffs against necessarily. But yeah, we'll see how they bounce back. I'm really going to have my eyes on that uh, Calgary Montreal five games that I outlined earlier. That that I think is going to be really close to playoff hockey in Montreal with the pressure you're speaking about. That's where they're going to have to put out their best and it'll be interesting to see how they do it. I would say the other way that you could possibly see one of those four teams falling out is if they are experiencing what the Vancouver Canucks are going through right now. And this is a team now, it's a scary situation. Over half of the players are confirmed. Uh, I guess that they have contracted COVID-19 really scary stuff. Um, I it's, it was bound to happen. Uh, we've seen a couple of other teams in other leagues experience this, but this is definitely the largest, I, I guess you could compare it to the Dallas stars, but largest kind of in season scare in the NHL and the North division had done relatively well staying away from it. But this is a big, uh, I guess, obstacle for the the league to overcome. And when Vancouver is finally back and ready to go, they're going to have to play a ton of games and a ton of nights with guys who are still recovering from a respiratory illness. Um, I just feel like they're going to fall off the table. And if another team was to, God forbid, have a similar situation, you could see a, a similar thing happening. So hoping that all the players and teams stay safe and that uh, Vancouver can get through this and hopefully figure out a way to to get a, their team back on the ice when when everyone is through the protocols but yeah definitely in there will be a very a thorough look through to see how this came about and and what the what the cause was because it is a pretty big event that happened yeah i i mean we saw it play out with montreal i think having two players test positive and it seemed like this was the wind was blowing the same way at first with um, two players on the Canucks being announced. And I thought the protocol was putting it off for a few extra days, to be honest, but then the contact tracing started coming through and the eyebrows just keep raising. And you, you feel like half the time when a professional athlete announces they have COVID you're hearing some kind of horror story from it. Um, In the UFC world, for example, the, featherweight champ alexander volkanovsky flies into las vegas one week away from his title defense feeling fine gets told he has covid and then kind of falls off the radar for a couple of weeks and then you just heard him say recently like feeling fine now but covid's no jokes folks that was scary so you've got to think with that many players on the Canucks positive, there's going to be at least a few guys held back. And if it's someone like a Quinn Hughes, who I know has it, um, what, any one of their key pieces is going to be so detrimental. I mean, the playoff hopes weren't abundant in the first place, but this seems like a rather unfortunate nail in the coffin and for sure some team investigation necessary. I, I don't know if I think I heard it's a variant, so maybe one of the ones that spreads more easily, but scary situation all around. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and you mentioned Volkanovsky. I don't know if he's going to be part of your combat corner, but that is where we are headed next. Uh, so we will take a quick break and be back. There's shortly. the smoothness of those transitions. Back. <laughs> and we're back. Max, you have something special for us today on Combat Corner, so I will let you get right into it. Yeah, this is the last week of No Fights booked for a little while, so it'll be right back to the normal bread and butter previews recaps for the most part starting Friday. So instead of just talking about some matches that got made this week, I thought I'd take the opportunity to commemorate the career of Habib Nurmagomedov with his retirement finally being official official even though there's pretty well zero chance of him fighting since he said but 
I want to start and end with just what a special career it was. I mean, there is never going to be a definitive GOAT in any sports, let alone something like mixed martial arts. But what you are going to have is a group of athletes who all showed you something different, but something special. And that, for sure, Khabib Nurmagomedov. I, I want to wind the clock back to... Uh, around UFC 216, the first full card I ever watched, uh, headlined by Tony Ferguson, Kevin Lee. I was still coming off the Conor McGregor hype, watching him box Mayweather. And I watched this main event, got super excited to see um, Conor fight Tony, which I thought would be this awesome fight. And UFC 217 follows and UFC 218, which all have some fantastic fights. And I'm kind of sealed for life probably as a UFC fan starting again the rhythm of watching every card and then UFC 219 for the first time I get to watch Khabib Nurmagomedov live going up against Edson Barboza and just see something otherworldly in this terrifying dominant performance that I guess a part of his legacy that I saw the tail end of was just the three round smash and getting to see it once against Barboza live was fantastic uh, going up against a top five striker on this knockout streak who has reportedly fantastic takedown defense and like I said showing something special so showing something different showing something terrifying relentless fearless stand-up pressure where all he needs to do is tie you up and then once he's got you tied up all he needs is one takedown and then once he gets one takedown the fight is basically over because he is going to smash you so hard that you are just going to be too compromised to really fight and have any chance to win for the rest of the fight and I got to see that for the first time live against Barboza and I think he had it on the judges scorecards like 30 25 30 25 30 24 or something which even to this day is a scorecard I haven't really heard repeated and it was just an instant fan for life type making performance and put him right on the radar me a guy who was really waiting to see connor come back in and defend his lightweight title and you start learning about what he did to michael johnson what he did to rafael dos anjos right before dos anjos went and won the lightweight title and started to understand what a problem this guy was for the division and then the legacy of this tony ferguson fight which gets made there's all this hype and then in a sequence of events i still can't believe three and a half four years later they make the fight it's 10 days away and then on april fools they announced that tony ferguson slipped on a microphone cord and like tore his legs so bad that he needed surgery that left him with a 12 inch scar i still can't quite believe that happens um carousel of opponents the most cursed card in ufc history but habib still makes the walk to the octagon against ally quinta on like a day and a half two days notice and i was thinking about short notice five round matchups recently um with this usman masvidal rematch kind of coming up sh soon and wondering like how harshly to judge usman for how safe he played it in the first matchup and i think khabib set a gold standard for that in the iaquinta matchup i mean iaquinta not the threat that masvidal is although iaquinta does have a win over him interestingly but khabib showed brilliance again taking it 50 43 showing what a dominant wrestler he is but also showing the stand-up off and showing his ability to read fights I, I mean you have no training camp time so you haven't really drilled for the specific guy you've got to get in there make your reads on him and do what you think is best and he mixed it up so beautifully I, I loved that third and fourth round because Iaquinta did his own like on the fly adjustments and said i don't want to get taken down and i'm going to compromise my stand-up ability crouch a little lower put myself in this position where i can't really initiate offense and i'm going to be half a second slower trying to counter but my takedown defense is going to be real solid how are you going to respond and habib responded by jabbing his face off it, it, like not the prettiest most technical jab but he landed it so effectively so repeatedly stayed out of danger from those counters and showed such high mixed martial arts iq 
won the fight 50 43 to get a belt wrapped around his waist and then there's some unhappiness because he's not the lineal champ he just got the belt awarded to him for beating like the guy who is at the lower end of the top 15 and what happens next he takes the belt from the lineal champ and conor mcgregor in the biggest fight in mixed martial arts history and i this night was so special for a lot of reasons to me but it was such an event it was family thanksgiving for us here in canada so i was with a lot of family and made them all watch it uh, made my sister a mixed martial arts fan on that night so that was nice but got to see Khabib perform and stay calm in the biggest fight of mixed martial arts history and you've seen Conor McGregor let the occasion rise and build up and get to so many guys and Khabib just cool as a cucumber in there until the fight ends admittedly but again just showed that specialness showed what a force he is showed that all he needs is one takedown and he is so good at getting that one takedown and never really let McGregor into it the only round he lost over the six fights I watched live in his career happened in that fight and even then it was like a 50-50 striking matchup where I think if McGregor doesn't cheat and grab the gloves in the last 60 seconds of that round Habib gets the takedown against the wall and cinches the round so even that asterisks but another phenomenal performance by him in that one that just I think that's when his star really shot up globally I mean at this point I'd been telling some of my friends about this guy for years or at least one year I guess that's not a full calendar year but but that's when people started to message me and were like yeah you're right this guy man and from there he just kind of put the gold seal on the resume in his matchups against uh, Poirier and Gaethje, both getting well-deserved title shots in the deepest division of the UFC. They were taking out killers. And Habib just continued to make it look easy against the absolute pound-for-pound best talent, most dangerous title contenders in the world in Poirier and Gaethje with these absolute grappling masterclasses and why I alluded to earlier in the Barboza fight is he got a little away from that like terrifying ground and pound. I think part of that was a five round adjustment to make sure he had the cardio to go all five rounds if needed, though he never did need them after that Iaquinta fight. Um, but I mean, he's so efficient on his trips, so effective with his stand up pressure so perfect at gassing opponents and making them wear down and making them frustrated making them mentally break you saw Poirier and Gaethje in the corners in between rounds just like fuck fuck I can't do anything I had a full training camp preparing exactly for this I've drilled these moves hundreds of times and it's no good there's nothing we can do and getting finishes submissions like just as a matter of due process um in between those two fights he of course was booked to fight tony ferguson one more time and i'm still not completely unconvinced that this global pandemic that we're in was in fact actually our uh, simulation overlords just needing to throw another wild card in there to stop the fight from happening because that's really what it felt like in March when the pandemic was bearing down and we were just watching a race for time with this fight. Maybe it's almost a mercy that Gaethje beat Ferguson and the fight was stopped at five count because if they had booked it for a sixth time, I think there would have been an alien invasion to prevent the fight from happening because April Fools tripping on a cord before that could be going into liver failure and then a goddamn global pandemic I, I, what can top that other than something ridiculous like an alien division or nuclear war so maybe for the planet's well-being that that fight what hasn't been booked for a sixth time and it's such a testament to Khabib's dominance that this for a solid period of time the most exciting fight in mixed martial arts history um isn't for me at least going to be one of the biggest what ifs because 
he was just that dominant and that special that in hindsight it's really no stretch of the imagination to think about how that fight against Tony would have gone even though both guys on double digit winning streaks in this terrifyingly deep division there doesn't really seem to be a lot of doubt even if Tony was at his best how that fight would have gone because again Khabib just such a special fighter he doesn't have the length of resume to compare to guys like GSP, Aldo, Demetrius Johnson, Asterix, John Jones, but he has something else. He has pure dominance in a division full of killers. Conor McGregor, Dustin Poirier, and uh, Justin Gaethje, like three guys who you've got to think are between the three of them going to at least present one knockout threat at some point in fights and no he did the same thing to all of them in just having perfect striking defense um getting the takedown wearing them down and winning flawlessly i can't imagine we'll ever see anything special as that again that level of dominance over that high level threat of opponents and it's really been such a pleasure to watch over these past few years and just looking back and reminiscing over it is so fun because what a special fighter I mean just congratulations to Khabib Nurmagomedov and I don't think his legacy on mixed martial arts is over as a fighter certainly but as a coach we might see him herald a fleet of Dagestani champions into the UFC He's talked about wanting to make mixed martial arts an Olympic sport, which I don't know how you get that many fights off over two weeks enough to do so, but that could be huge. So looking forward to the next chapter in his mixed martial arts legacy. And we're back. I guess no one told the Toronto Raptors that you can't just win one game by 52 points you need to spread out that scoring and maybe win five games by a spread of 10 but uh a lot of bottled up energy being released against the warriors eh yes that is definitely what happened uh to kick off our basketball talk this was i want to i want to preface this by saying there are in the nba there are such things as schedule losses So a team is playing their third game in four nights on the road back to back, or they've just played a long road trip and then they have this long flight back. They get in at 3 a.m. and then they got a game the next day. Um, And this was an instance where the Warriors were set up for a schedule loss. They then proceed to bench Steph and Dre for injury reasons. Uh, And they trotted out a a team that was ill-prepared or at least was not ready to go up against a Raptors team that has had a terrible month of March and was absolutely chomping at the bit to lay the smack down on a team that one of the very few teams in the league that also did not have a solid center. (laughs) Now, Kevon Looney is fine, but again, a bench level center, very equivalent to Aaron Baines. And then James Wiseman has actually really struggled this year. He's shown some flashes of potential, but, um, has really struggled in the NBA. And and so he was just being abused all game by the Raptors and they laid the Holy Smackdown upon the Warriors. Uh, the game was pretty tight after the first quarter. Uh, the second quarter Raps get a bit of a lead, but the third quarter I believe was 46 to 14. Uh, and so, and, and the Raptors just like, they weren't even easing up. It was, they were up by like 40 and they were getting steals. And I think that's why Gary Trent got fouled so hard by Damian Lee. Uh, he went up for a layup and Lee came and basically tackled him, <laughs> put his arm around his head. And it was a scary moment. I thought Trent was hurt. Uh, he was grabbing the back of his knee a little bit. So probably just stretched out a, l- a little, but yeah, the, uh, the Warriors were, brutalized and for the for the Raptors that's a great feeling that you got to take away from that game because even though the tank is on uh you still got to have those moments to at least keep the season worth playing for um because otherwise it'll just kill team morale and (laughs) Gary Trent has been awesome so far for the Raptors since arriving Uh, I think he's averaging 24 points like four rebounds two steals really awesome so far for him and 
Uh, he was a plus 54 in this game. <laughs> And plus minus isn't the best indicator, but sometimes you just have outliers like this that are just so fun to look at. Uh, beating Kyle Lowry's point differential that he established just two weeks ago against the Nuggets uh, as the record. And so very funny that the Raptors have interspersed their dozens of losses with two absolute blowout wins against the Nuggets and the Warriors. Um, but yeah, uh, just... A good win for them, good solid win. And I think it's important for them to have a couple wins, but you still would like to see at this point as a fan, you would like to see them fall a little bit deeper down the standings. And and I don't I really just it's so hard to do so because those bottom teams in the East are just so bad. Uh so it will really be interesting to see who does the best tank. And I don't know if Lowry will come back. He'll want to play, but just making sure that that foot is figured out because he continues to miss games and so we will keep track of the raptors but a, a fun one for the fans who have been looking for a bright spot in the season in the last couple weeks yeah you feel like one of the strengths of this team is that championship run and the pressure they're bringing to the playoffs every year before and you kind of saw that carry over into the season after the championship run where they did far better than anyone really expected without Kawhi. And you worry that too much time spent losing and they might forget how to win. So mm -hmm. I don't know if a game like this, well, a game like this isn't enough to throw that away, but that's something I'm going to be looking for next season. And yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. And, and don't get me wrong. If the Raptors get into that 10 seed, I think they honestly could make a little bit of noise just with the playoff pedigree that they've established so far. I think they can beat any one of those like the seven through 10 seeds. And uh, you could even see them making a little bit of noise in the bottom half of those Eastern teams, but just Brooklyn, Philadelphia, Milwaukee, those are the three at the top of the East right now. And so speaking of the top of the East, the Milwaukee Bucks have reached a max extension four year extension with Drew Holiday after he carries them to a win against the Sacramento Kings with 33 points. I think 16 of those were in the fourth quarter, just absolute stellar showing from him uh, without Giannis in the lineup. He takes over. He's such a big part of their playoff plans and what they hope to do over the next couple of years with Giannis coming into the prime of his career. Uh, and so they max him. He's locked in. He'll be a buck for the next four years and we'll see how he performs come playoff time. But he's a guy who's tended to show up was a really big part of the, the that series where the Pelicans eight seed or eight or seven seed and they come in and they just beat up on the Portland trailblazers and he just stifles Damian Lillard and scoring on the other way, other side. And yeah, so a, a good signing, I guess. I don't know if he's still, he's going to be worth max money two years from now. Cause he's getting up there in age, but for the win now move, uh, you pay a guy right after his great day and uh, everyone in the, everyone in Milwaukee's riding high and doesn't question the signing when he's coming off a, an excellent performance. Yeah. How do you feel if you're a Bucks fan heading into these playoffs? I mean, you've had the number one team in the division conference and the league MVP two years, and then losses coming to teams, maybe certainly not expected against the heat. I, maybe a little less surprising against the Raptors, but you can write those off or can you write those off as losses against teams just playing way above their level at the playoffs and it just being a matter of time before there isn't one of those teams in the playoffs? Do you feel more optimistic with this kind of big three they have locked up at the cost of maybe a little less depth? How, how optimistic, pessimistic do you think the Bucks fans are right now? Yeah, I, I would first go into, it's kind of a mini comparison to the, to the Raptors teams that we knew and loved so much with the Kyle and DeMar era getting to the conference finals and coming up short to those LeBron Cavaliers. And finally, you make the adjustments to the team and LeBron it ends leaves. up being, a, yeah, it, well, yes, LeBron also leaves, but it, it's eventually the, you change the team and you spend a little bit more time figuring things out in the regular season rather than just killing teams so that your team is ready and 
raring to go come playoff time. And that feels a little bit like what Milwaukee's doing. They're tinkering a little bit more with Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday running pick and roll with Giannis screening, or you have Giannis operating a low post, or you have just different defensive styles, a little bit more switching as opposed to just sitting Brooke Lopez deep on all your pick and rolls. Um, it's a team that's trying to figure out what identity it wants to be come playoff time. I still worry about what Budenholzer is going to bring to the table because he's just hasn't had that same level of playoff success that he's had in the regular season. But if you're a Milwaukee fan, you got to be excited because even though Brooklyn is a team to beat, right? And, and no one really has a matchup for them. You can at least score with them because you know that no one on that team can guard Giannis. No one on that team can guard Chris Middleton. No one on that team can guard Drew Holiday. But you maybe think that you have a little bit more of that defensive punch to give to Brooklyn where you can throw Chris Middleton or Drew Holiday or Dante DiVincenzo at a number of those guards that Brooklyn offers. I think P.J. Tucker has no foot speed anymore. The only guy that he would see him be guarding at any point would be Kevin Durant. If you put him on Harden or Kyrie, he's just going to get cooked. Um, So you could see P.J. Tucker even operating as like the small ball five on a Blake Griffin, on a LaMarcus Aldridge, on a uh, DeAndre Jordan or Jeff Green. And then you might have Giannis take that Kevin Durant matchup for quite a bit of the series. Because if there's anyone who could somehow slow down KD, like no one can stop him, it would be a guy built like Giannis, right? They're basically, they're built very similarly. Um, and so that's a team... If, if you're Milwaukee, you actually don't mind the matchup against Brooklyn. I worry about Philadelphia for them because no one in the East has a person who can match up against Embiid. I don't even know if anyone in the league has a center who can match up against Embiid. Just with how brutally dominating he is when he wants to be, it's just about will we get that level of Embiid? And additionally, just like the Sixers defense is the real deal. They have the best defense in the Eastern Conference. You saw it when Embiid was out for a couple of weeks. They still were far and away the best defense in the league. Ben Simmons guards anyone one through five, it feels like, uh, and a bunch of other guys who contribute. And so the Sixers team, I honestly, I feel like is a worse matchup for Milwaukee at this point. And that might be the team that you see in the second round if it's a 2-3 matchup uh, and Brooklyn takes that one seed. So if you're a Milwaukee fan, you got to be excited because you have a third guy now who can provide you that late game scoring that you don't just have to rely on Giannis pulling threes because you never want to see that. Uh, and that's what Drew Holiday can do. He's a guy who shows up in big games. The, the worry you have right now is making sure your entire team is fresh going into the playoffs and that you don't fall out of that top three seed spot because I think Miami's trying to make a little bit of a run up into that top four but this team was really meant missing the mental toughness that's why they lost four straight to Toronto that's why Miami just alpha dogged them last year they're missing a little bit of that mental toughness Giannis is is a guy who is completely mentally tough but he's a guy who when he goes out there it's like I'm so thankful for this opportunity like Giannis is the uh, like you can't hate Giannis. He's just like the nicest guy, the most humble kid. He just loves playing. Um, and when he loses, obviously he's, it sucks, but he's also like, I'm just happy that I'm alive and that I'm here playing. And so it's a little bit different from, I don't know, those like a, the other guys who just have that even like further bit of competitive energy where it's like, if I lose, I'm coming out and I'm killing you the next game. And that's what they need from Giannis. And I think Drew Holiday has a little bit more of that just a little bit more of that grit. Uh, and so hopefully that's what they can get out of him come playoff time. And if you're Milwaukee, you just got to be excited because every time your team is in the hunt, there's always a chance. So yeah, shout out to the Bucks. Shout out to Drew Holiday. Congrats on the bag, my friend. <laughs> I guess I'll end saying what you talk, a sign of greatness and talent is learning from mistakes and losses and you kind of alluded to that with the Raptors building, 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 and culminating in that playoff win. So in hindsight, we might be able to say those two playoff exits built the mental toughness you're commenting on, and they put the pieces together finally, or it'll be a cursed playoff team. Time will tell. Yes, sir. Looking forward to that. 
I want to touch on one more East team in the NBA before we jump to uh, the big basketball stories of the weekend, but the Chicago Bulls, who very under the radar had lost six in a row coming into yesterday's game against the Nets. Another schedule loss, by the way. Uh, Chicago arrived back from Utah at 3 a.m. into Chicago, and uh, this was an afternoon game against the Brooklyn Nets. Um, so definitely a tough one for them. They were 0-5 so far with Vucevic after they had made that trade. And this was a team that really has been trying to figure out how their top pieces are going to fit together with Levine and Vucevic and figure out who that point guard is going to be in their starting rotation. Looks like it's going to be uh, Sadoransky. And then you also have Daniel Tice and Laurie Markkinen who need to get minutes as a big and how are they going to play together? I think at one point I was watching the game, they had Vucevic, Tice and Markkinen all out on the floor. So they had like a, a six foot 11 dude playing the three. It was interesting to say the least. And I think it was decently effective. They just went big on Brooklyn and said, okay, we're just going to shoot over you or uh, beat you down in the post. And uh, they finally win against the Brooklyn Nets who were without James Harden and Kevin Durant. So uh, it was a bit of the Kyrie show and just wasn't enough today. Although the Nets, again, one of those teams that's really just coasting and somehow beating up on a lot of teams and they might get the one or two seed without having to really put a ton of miles on their top guys, which is worrisome if you're the rest of the East. Um, but yeah, the Bulls finally get their first win with, with Vucevic in the lineup and Tyson in the lineup and uh, they're looking to still try and con configure things. Uh, and this could be a team that could make a little bit of noise because uh, Vucevic is a solid center and Levine, if he has, this is basically for them. They want to get in the playoffs so they can see what kind of ceiling Levine has. Can he be the number one guy on a playoff team? My gut says no, but he has taken steps every season to improve his game and has been really remarkable this season as he got his first all-star appearance. So looking forward to continue to follow the bulls and see what they do in their run towards a playing seed and maybe jumping into that six or five seed because all still all of the like four through 10 in the East is still very uh, compact. So looking to see how that shapes out. All right, we will move to the NCAA uh, where in the woman's side, Arizona upsets UConn, the pick that I had for uh, the, the champions. Of course, you love watching Paige Beckers. She is the first freshman to win the AP All-American Player of the Year Award. Really impressive accomplishment for her, but her Huskies go down to the Arizona Wildcats, and Stanford survives a very late uh, floater that rims out to make it to the final uh, after they beat South Carolina. And then in the final game on the woman's side, Stanford pulls it out again. Aaliyah, uh, or I forget, it's Ali, Ali Johnson, I think. Ooh, I feel bad not knowing the name, but she was cooking in that game. She had a look and it a three just didn't go. Stanford wins. Uh, congratulations to them. First national title since 1992. And uh, an Ivy League school that also is good at sports just seems not fair. <laughs> All right. We will now get to the basketball story that lit up the weekend. The sport, I can't believe you haven't gotten here yet. Owen, what are you doing? Get to the point. Jalen Suggs. The top three pick who I told you, you have to follow this kid. He was a top recruit at quarterback coming out of high school, top recruit as a point guard. He's got amazing physical tools, and he hits the biggest shot of the tournament, one of the biggest shots in March Madness history, a game-winning buzzer beater on April 3rd, 2021, Max. In America, they call that four three two one. Huh. The date. <laughs> so funny, awesome coincidence there. About uh, four seconds left. When he inbound took the ball in. <laughs> yeah. Three and a half. Uh, had a great sequence earlier in the in the fourth quarter where he gets the block and on like a power forward. Yeah, comes up behind him. Some people say foul. I say block. <laughs> Hand is part of the ball when in contact with the ball. Uh, gets the block. Maybe steps out of bounds, but also gets as a rebound and then throws a sick one-handed bounce pass uh, for the dunk in transition. Kid fans were going crazy. Then we have our Canadian kid, Andrew Nembhard, 
with the crossover step back three oh. nasty move. I know he's, he's going to be fun to watch. Uh, Canadian basketball, such a great place right now. And then Johnny Juzang, Johnny buckets, who has been unbelievable all tournament for UCLA Man, gets work. Yeah. No one has a right to that high a percentage of contested mid range shots, but like yeah, all game or all. Well, yeah. Yeah. Half. UCLA in general, just had a ton of shot making in that game. I think they had their centers. They were talking about like, wasn't a jump shooter and he made, he went four or four from like mid range, just making shots that no one it, really expected him to make clutch three there towards the end to yeah. even set up that last sequence yeah and and he gets on the switch he gets to the spot in the lane the guys the whole broadcast was going this is a kid who knows how to get to his spots and he got to his spot floater doesn't go but he gets his own rebound because when you've been playing that well the ball finds you lays it up 3.3 left on the shot clock jalen sucks gonzaga has a timeout They have a timeout, but maybe this is a lesson to coaches out there that sometimes it's better to just go before the defense is set, before they get a chance to look at what play you want to run and just let your guy go to work. The coach said in the interview after the game, this was stuff that they had worked on in practice. You work on those late game scenarios. And this was a kid that consistently came through for them time and time again. He knew when he shot it, it was going in and Jalen Suggs, sprints the length to the floor knows exactly when he wants to get the shot up too. because some kids will like shoot a half court shot just a second too early but he goes right to around the 40 foot mark elevates perfect timing banks it in wow what a moment like just and and he said after the game he wanted to go up on the scores table to celebrate just like Dwayne Wade one of his idols and uh and Wade called him out after the game just like that was sick and just such an incredible moment that we had been waiting for because the Elite Eight, a little bit of a snooze fest, couple blowouts, uh, hadn't been a game-winning buzzer beater yet in the tournament, and we finally get it in one of the biggest games. And now the title game is set tonight. The two behemoths, Baylor and Gonzaga. Gonzaga going for the undefeated season. Baylor looking to upset them. Uh, another great team who just like crushed Houston in the other final four game. We didn't really even need to tune in too much to that one, but yeah, should be an awesome, awesome game. I cannot wait. Uh, it, it, yeah, <laughs> I'm on the edge of my seat right now. Just thinking about it. It's going to be a fun one. And just to like go into Gonzaga, especially and Baylor too, but a lot of NBA player ready players on both sides for these teams. Like you've got Jalen Suggs, of course, who's going to be a top five pick. And then you've got uh, Corey Kispert and Andrew Nemhard, a couple other great shooters for Gonzaga. And, and Drew Timmy has been having a great tournament. He'll, if he gets drafted, might be a little bit later in the draft just because I don't know how well his game will translate to the NBA. He's a dominant college player, but some of those guys just don't convert. Uh, and, and yeah, just Gonzaga's got a ton of NBA players, and so does Baylor. And so this should be just an awesome game. I am, I worry about one, like it just ending in a blowout, <laughs> but you got to imagine that these teams are going to be tight because this is the biggest game they've ever played in. And sometimes the nerves get to you. So it might be a slow start, kind of like how we see in the Super Bowl. Uh, but this, I think we're going to have something special happen near the end of this game. And, and I'm just really looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah. It'll be interesting to see with this uh, two very different final four games having happened for each team if that plays out at all if it's a tight game I mean Gonzaga I mean UCLA I feel like was the story of that game up until um, that crazy buzzer beater I mean they just hung in there and had like the shot making games of their careers for a lot of them probably and they had to do that because Gonzaga was just getting easy buckets all night oh, I mean, they are such a great offense yeah and that they were so calm so clutch in a situation they hadn't been in and just generated such score solid scoring chances almost every time down the court even though it sounds like that's not really their game they normally they're used to excelling with defensive stops and getting the points in transition so they're put in an uncomfortable situation with more pressure than they've experienced all season and still made the scoring look easy and weathered the defensive effort so i wonder if that 
is going to show itself in the finals tonight if we see a similar run down the stretch, how that holds up. Yeah. Yeah. Both teams that are accustomed to blowouts, right? And Gonzaga's average margin of victory before this game, I think, was like 17 or something. <laughs> like they just blow teams out. I think and so, saying they were on like a 20 something game streak of winning games by double digits. Yeah. They just have been dominant. And this was the game where they finally got tested. And I think Baylor's had a couple, but similar story where a team just with a ton of blowouts consecutively. And so we'll see another situation where if it comes down to the wire, how will these kids react when they're not winning by 10? Very exciting stuff. Uh, we look forward to the game tonight and we'll bring you, I guess, a brief recap of that on Friday, although it might be far and away in everyone's minds by then, but looking forward to it. Enjoy the game. We'll take a quick break and come back for some tennis. And we're back. We had not the ideal outcome of the Miami Open over the weekend, but still a performance to be proud of and another story of injury for Bianca Andreescu as she falls to Ash Barty in the Miami Open final. But uh, we have a couple of takeaways from that match. So, Max, I will let you lead off with your thoughts. Yeah, for the most part, it did look as advertised. The number one seed in the world up against a young up-and-comer who's still trying to put her game together. I mean, Ash Barty was fairly dominant throughout that match while it lasted. Bianca had her moments, but Barty really dominant at the start of that first set, which I thought was interesting. Bianca elected to receive serve and then was broken on her first serve. Like she almost knew she'd want some time to work into it and didn't want the first three games to be two of her serves with the potential to go down two breaks to zero. Uh, she had her rally some momentum in the middle of that first set, but Bardi closed it really well. And I thought it looked like two pretty similar styles of play where they're both going to try and play at their pace, kind of relax, not throwing absolute killers on every shot, mixing it up between the forehand, the backhand, the top spin, the slices, the drop shots, and just try and feel around for something and then pounce when the moment arrives and Bardi able to impose that style of play better on Bianca. Um, she generated a lot more winners, just taking control of most of the rallies and uh, getting the ball where she wanted, getting Bianca where she wanted and putting points away fairly consistently. And then second set was off to the same start, but Bianca stumbles. She goes over herself on her ankle. Uh, you thought it might have been it right then and there. She took a while to get up and then kind of forgot about it right after because she just went back to playing. But it became pretty apparent shortly after that it was still troubling her and she was forced to retire. So not in that moment, pretty disappointing when you pull out in the grand scheme this was far better placement than was speculated or hoped for her in a Miami Open tournament that had all the best players in the world in on the female side of the draw competing so really as competitive as any Grand Slam you're going to get and Bianca makes it to the finals so not a week to be shamed about at all and yeah I don't know what you thought about this all so she We'll be moving up three spots. She'll be ranked sixth in the world, which is just two away from her highest ever ranking of four, which is incredible for someone who's 20 years old. First, I would like to say that. Um, and then second, she will be pulling out of the Billie Jean King Open, of course, uh, in order to rest up for clay season. And my thoughts are that she is still so young, and I can see a lot of the injuries coming from when you're young, and obviously we know this, when you're hurt, you tend to just go through it because you can heal faster, your body recovers quicker, uh, you can deal with that sort of stuff. And I think when Bianca's at such a, like a beginning of, such, of a potential for such a fruitful career, she has to see the warning signs here and 
look to those who have made their careers off of longevity and success. Obviously, like my mind, of course, goes to basketball because that's what I know. But when you've got guys like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in the NBA was like the first player to really start doing yoga and taking care of himself. And that's why he played so long and has the all-time points record. And you've got like guys like Steve Nash. And of course, the most prevalent example is LeBron James. In football, you've got Russell Wilson. Uh, I guess in tennis, like you could even say Serena Williams, right? That's a, a good person for Bianca to look up to. But these are the people who spend so much money and time taking care of their bodies, recovering, stretching, whatever else it need, you need to do. I'm sure I don't know half of the stuff that goes on, even though I took a kinesiology degree um, because it's just so advanced in how they treat their players. And she needs to start doing it now because it's frightening to see the number of injuries. Some of them you can call freak, but a lot, of, a lot of injuries come from compounding issues where you're compensating for an ankle or you're compensating for a knee and it leads to a hip issue and you've got misalignment. And, and so it's something that she really has to be careful about and really actually take the time to fully recover from this one. Uh, because like she, you can see, she had those moments in the Miami open where she's just awesome and completely unstoppable. And, you worry that injuries are going to derail a career before it really even gets going. And so I just hope that she can stay healthy and, and come back and, and play and maintain her health because that is at this point, it's the most important thing for her to focus on. Yeah. I didn't have you followed up on the research. Like, are there any updates on the ankle? I haven't heard anything in terms of severity time frame. I haven't seen anything. I imagine it's something minor, but with ankle sprains like that, they can linger. Uh, and so you just want to make sure it's healed and you work the strength and range of motion back up. Uh, and, and it's just better off. She made a ton of money off this tournament. So it's okay probably to take this next one off just to make sure that she's fully healed in time for clay season. Yeah. And I was looking into it. I think she played uh, four, three set matches over a span of five days, which that's another part of the story and something that was talked about as potentially leading to her last long layoff from injury, just the accumulation and wear and tear. And look, it's not entirely in her control how well her opponents are going to play and when she's going to have those putaways fall behind her. So as much as I'd like to say, start winning more matches in two sets, that's less in your control than the stuff you're talking about, the strength and conditioning. So maybe someone who's a part of that team just needs to say, look, we're, we're going to be in, we're going to be in the pocket for a long time in this career and have a lot of these, we need to figure out how to create an athlete who can survive and thrive in these long three set matches, because I, I think it's better to focus on something that's 100% in your control than say, hey, come on, you've just got to get that volley 10 times out of 10 because that's such a tall order in, yeah. at the highest level of professional sports. Definitely. There were some comments that I saw, and obviously you're going to get negativity everywhere, of people saying that Bianca uses the injury a little bit as an excuse to get out of the match. Um, it's definitely something that, as someone who's super competitive, it's an excuse that you fall on on before, right? Where you have to, you lose or you have to pull out and it's like, ah, I was feeling this, I was tight here, whatever. But it just feels like with her, like she just seems very genuine in how she plays. And that can kind of rub off a little bit as like cockiness or a swagger that some of the other demographics don't enjoy in, in a, a sport like tennis, where it is very professional, conceited, you stay within the lines. Um, and so with Bianca wearing her emotion on her sleeve, like she did and, and having to pull out an injury, you just, you can't, you can't ever think that she's faking because everything that we've seen out of here has com been completely genuine, uh, whether it's in winning or in losing. Uh, and so just screw the haters. Keep going, Bianca. <laughs> That's, it's like you said, she wears her emotions on her sleeve. It was very clear how devastated she was. Uh, I think the match ended on an ace from Bardi and Bianca just collapsed because she knew that on her ankle, there was never going to be a sequence where she gets to that serve and you saw that realization hit her and that the match was over. Um, there's some situations where 
what you're saying plays out where you are pitted in a 50 50 matchup and you are expected to compete and do well and win and the onus is on you to do that and you can fall back on an injury and say oh if it wasn't for the injury i would have won that wasn't the story here she was the underdog going in she played like the underdog this was an opportunity to collect valuable experience playing against the number one seed in the world and every rally every point every game counted and was building towards that it yeah i like you said screw the haters let's go bianca yeah all right i think that's it for our tennis segment We'll take one last quick break uh, and have some baseball news for y'all. All All right. It's time to wrap up the show. We've got some baseball news and moving to a more American support, American sport. Uh, Let's roast this big. I think that's an expression. Finish this up. Yeah, let's do it. I would like to take the first portion of this segment to take a moment to drink in the salty tears of Yankees fans. tastes so good whenever any team can beat the yankees in a series you just have to savor the moment because they are the big bad wolf of baseball uh them and probably the dodgers as well but no one likes the yankees and the toronto blue jays go in to the bronx and steal a series 2-1 and uh a great game yesterday i watched 90 percent of it Vladdy with his first hashtag placata of the series of the season, just launching an opposite field home run. Uh, TJ Zoik, who got beat up by the Phillies in his last spring training start, comes in, gives a different look. He is a more traditional pitcher with the two seamer who pitches to contact as opposed to the new age baseball pitchers who pitch hard and they pitch nasty sliders and they just throw as hard as they can. Zoik is a little bit slower, but he goes uh, for contact in, induces weak contact. And, and we saw that, uh, he goes four innings without giving up a run really solid effort from him. And, uh, then the blue Jays behind him go the rest of the game, only give up one run really from, uh, Trent Thornton having a bit of struggles in his first full inning of relief, but Alejandro Kirk behind the plate called a great game. Uh, Really proud of him because this is his first full MLB season that he's going to play outside of only ever playing high A ball before. And a lot of people excited about his bat, but he really needs to be able to have that calling ability and that defensive ability behind the plate as a catcher for him to really provide value to a team. You can't just hit if you're a catcher. You got to also be able to catch uh, and, and call the game. And I guess I'll, I'll, talk a little bit more about the Jays, but Julian Merriweather. Uh, I thought about writing a blog post about this, but sometimes everyone, GMs actually know what they're doing, believe it or not. that's They get paid to do this job, and they actually do it well. Uh, and, and Ross Atkins trading Josh Donaldson a couple years ago. Julian Merriweather, um, a injury-prone pitcher coming back in that deal. Fans... Not happy about the move at the time because, of course, Donaldson is a uh, a love of Blue Jays fans. He just was a fan favorite, provide a lot of energy, a lot of fun moments over the years. But they move off of him because he it was his last year on his contract, and they pick up this prospect. And to start this season, Julian Merriweather, uh, two innings, <laughs> two saves, a ton of Ks. He just has wicked stuff hits hits triple digits on the fastball throws a wicked slider uh, and gets a change up in there as well he, all three of those pitches excellent and really showing that the jays actually probably won that trade and while fans were not happy about the move when it happened this is a kid who's going to really contribute to the blue jays winning this year and really fantastic stuff he looks to be our closer for now uh, they said at the beginning of the season that the Jays are kind of just going to pitch to leverage. They're not going to have a seventh inning guy, an eighth inning guy, a ninth inning guy. They're just going to go with the best, best matchups against certain hitters and go with the guys who they trust the most in high leverage situations. And so far, that's been Julian Merriweather. And he's really responded well. His first two saves coming in in uh, Yankee Stadium, which is not an easy place to pitch. So congrats to him. Congrats to Jays. They take that series and they move on to Arlington, Texas, 
And I already mentioned, we think it's going to be a packed house in Texas. So this will be an interesting series for them to see how they respond to the crowd. I think their game is at four o'clock today. So perfect day for me. I finish up school around four. Then I get to watch the Blue Jays game. And then I get to go right into March Madness. Does it get any better than that? (laughs) All right. So cheers to the Jays. We move into other news around the league. Yerman Mercedes, who only had ever had one major league at bat prior to this season, gets into the lineup because White Sox star Eloy Jimenez uh, out with an injury. And this kid, Mercedes, who no one had ever heard of, starts his MLB career going eight for eight. His first game, he gets five hits, goes five for five, and then starts out his second game with three hits. Uh, So eight for eight to start eventually flies out to Mike Trout in his ninth at bat, but a really fun, uh, exciting start to the season for him. And this White Sox lineup, man, I'm telling you, a lot of injuries already in the season for them, which isn't great, but they still have a bunch of people who can mash. And and that is why I had them going pretty deep in the uh, postseason. But just an exciting start for the kid. Uh, He's 28 years old as a rookie, which is more common in baseball than you might think because of how long the development timeline is on some of these guys. But yeah, congrats to him. That's a great start. And he had as many hits in his first two games as the entire Atlanta Braves team did in their first two games as the Philadelphia Phillies just dominated them in a three game sweep of of great pitching from the Phillies. But yeah, Braves need to get going quickly because that's three games that you lose to a division rival. We arrive in Los Angeles, uh, also a team that Chicago played this weekend. And we got to see our first look of regular season action for Shohei Otani, who started and batted second in the lineup. The first pitcher to bat second in an MLB lineup since 1918. (laughs) Yeah, because pitchers just do not hit, right? But he does. And he hits 101 miles per hour with his fastball in the game, the hardest pitch so far of the MLB season, then proceeds to hit a 450-foot bomb to right center. I don't know if you saw that highlight, Max, but that swing is so sweet. He, like, that is, it. you could hear it so definitively when he hit it. Like, one of the loudest balls I've heard coming off a bat just absolutely crushed it uh, and just flashing so much of that potential that we are so excited to see. Scary moment. He had gone four four and two-thirds inning, only given up one run. He had walked five, though, and struck out six. So he had a lot of pitches, uh, and he was covering home on a throw home on an error to throw first uh, and gets slid into by Jose Abreu, takes his legs out. He would leave the game. So now we are looking to see if Shohei will be hurt long-term. It looked okay, but hopefully he's healthy because we we really want to see him out there. He is a special talent, and... A uh, historic night last night for him, and hopefully he's back healthy and ready to go again because when you throw the fastest pitch of the season and hit the hardest ball of the season in one night, it's something special. Yeah. I believe the term is human highlight reel when you have that kind of ability, although you you wonder and worry what kind of toll does that take on the human body to have that kind of output and I mean, it's nice to hear that's a leg injury, but like eyes on the upper body of Otani all season, probably. eh? Yeah, uh, yeah, that'll be the running story. But for now, just enjoy showtime. (laughs) All right. The last thing I wanted to talk about uh, is the changing of the MLB strategy, I would guess. The game is just changing, right? And this weekend, in all of those games of Major League Action, only three pitchers pitched over a 100 pitches this weekend. And it's something that used to just be so commonplace. Everyday pitchers, your starter would go out there, despite how many runs they just pitch, right? It was no limit. And now people are so concerned about the limit and maintaining the long-term health of pitchers. Uh, and obviously important, right? Because these are guys who you invest a lot of money into and you want to have long-term and uh, pitchers are always pitching injured. There's always something going on. The body is not designed to throw a ball like that and generate so much force. And so guys are always getting hurt stress on ligaments, tendons, bones. Um, And so that's why these limits are in place, but just really interesting to see how the world is changing. And uh, 
very few guys are going to hit that five inning requirement anymore to get wins. Cause that was the requirement for starting pitchers. You have to hit five innings to get uh, awarded the win and uh, 100 pitches is, is not, it's, it, it's less pitches than you might think. Like guys can pitch a lot of pitches in an inning, especially some of those guys with all these great lineups now who can really work out walks or just mash balls. And so, uh, really interesting to see how the game is changing. A lot more specialized relievers coming in. Um, a lot of long range, like we saw Michael King yesterday for the Yankees pitch six innings out of the bullpen, uh, but that was mostly because the Jays just seemed to stop caring about offense once they had the lead. Uh, yeah, so it just is interesting to see how the game is changing with multiple guys being able to go kind of two, three innings as opposed to your starter who's going to come in, take the ball every five days and give you seven innings. That just is, it's a dying breed nowadays. And uh, just thought that was an interesting theme to start the season, but yeah, Max, do you have anything to comment on that? Not comment, I guess just probe a little deeper and get yeah. your thoughts on, is that like, does that slow down the game, make it more defensive, make it more boring, but we're counter balancing that with the importance of the health of the players obviously i mean you can't tell them to throw softer that's yeah yeah it's baseball has become so analytical that it's from what the studies have shown guys who throw harder with a greater spin rate with a similar arm angle are gonna produce outs you want swing and misses as opposed to guys inducing contact because when you get swings and misses there's less chance of a ball being put in play and something bad happening and also just harder to hit a guy who throws when you, when the guy throws harder, you have less time to see the pitch. It's just common. Like a, if you have less time to swing, then it's going to be harder to hit the ball. Um, and so that is one of the ways that, that it has changed. I think as well, there's been more in studies done into working guys up. So we will see more guys hitting that hundred pitches later in the season, but really early in the season, you're still trying to work up that workload. So that is one of the factors contributing. And I think the game just changes because when you have more pitchers coming into the game, it is going to take longer because there's more breaks when they're coming. That's why they introduced that new rule that any reliever now has to face three batters or end an inning. Uh, you can't just bring a guy in for one batter that is you can't do that anymore it changes the defense a little bit because we'll now just shifts everywhere they they'll play like four outfielders sometimes or they'll have guys moved all the way around to the right side or the left side of the diamond it's yeah it's it's becoming intensely analytical I wouldn't say that it's really changing anything too much with like the game of baseball itself it's just changing the strategy and and I, I definitely have to do, look a little bit more into it, but just, yeah, it's intensely analytical baseball is now. And so all the reasons why people aren't pitching a hundred, a lot of it's health related. And a lot of it is you don't want guys facing the lineup three times through because data suggests that once you face the hitters for a third time, all the batting averages go up by about a hundred points. So uh, that's a big reason as well. Yeah. It I, I'm just assuming that these decisions lead to uh, better defense and better defense leads to more boring baseball. So I'm wondering about that tension between health of players and maybe a decline in excitement of the sport and wondering if the commission or has to weigh in on that or they just let it play out and whatever happens, happens. Because I there's like a Chinese idiom that a um, hundred leg centipede still stands strong when it dies and it yeah. just means like such a behemoth of a sport and baseball isn't going anywhere even if we talk about it getting more boring eh? i mean, messed up that idiom but i think i got the point <laughs> across yeah it's they also talk about another thing that is interesting to watch this season is apparently they have changed the baseball and it's supposed to be deadened a little bit because there were just according to the league too many home runs last year which if you're talking about game, making the game more fun, why would you want less home runs? So that's another thing to watch. Uh, but the game has become a lot of guys looking for swing and miss and a lot of batters looking to either home run or strike out. And so you do see it's, it's the defense is 
changing, but it's almost like you're getting less defense because there's going to be more strikeouts and more home runs. And when those two things happen, no defense is needed to be played. Um, so just interesting to see. There, there will be more stories written as it comes out, and I'll be doing the reading on it, and I'll be able to relay a lot of that information here. Uh, but we will continue to track the MLB season as it gets underway. Uh, it's going to be a long season, so <laughs> don't expect too much out of me every every podcast or so because I'm really going to only have to try and, and take away some of the big themes that I've seen. And then, of course, a lot of Blue Jays action because that will be the team that I follow. So thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in today to another podcast. Uh, we thank each and every one of you for listening, and we appreciate the support. Uh, continue to share the podcast whenever you can, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever else you get your podcasts. Uh, we have an Instagram page, a Twitter page, a YouTube page that uh, people have been loving the Bianca action and, and some of the baseball action. So don't be afraid to get on there. Give us a like, subscribe, share it with your friends. And, and Max, you have an exciting announcement, a new addition to the Sports Next Door network. Yeah, we've we had a website before that was used just to host the podcast episodes. We've updated that. So we have a new website page, which you can find on our Instagram. Uh, also, it'll be in the link or the description of every YouTube video that goes up and uh, there will be a blog on that. So a lot of the small to medium level stories that break, especially on like a Tuesday or a Friday afternoon that seem hype and somewhat important at the time, but have kind of fizzled out by the time the time to record the podcast arrives. We'll hopefully be able to provide coverage on there. I'm hoping just being in that mindset of writing all the time uh, and thinking a little different brings up the level of this podcast. You can see the podcast episodes there. And also I'm hoping to add some new analytics on there, like a tracker for the Canadian division teams against each other. And eventually a new model of UFC rankings, which we'll get to later, but check out our website. Um, everything sports next door will be coming through that website and there for you to check out um, just another step forward in this venture. So yeah. check it out. And Great. I think that wraps up the pod. Yeah. yeah. All right. Happy zombie Jesus day to everyone out there. Take care. Sports next door signing off. <laughs>